So hello everyone, I'm Joshua, and what I'm gonna share with you today is something of an excerpt or summary of a talk that I recently gave in Zurich at a, at a leading think tank. It was to a general audience, hundreds of people from mostly business and some from the academy. And this talk, as you can see here, which was titled, We as Nature Are the Planet Alive, was based upon a prompt that they gave me to speak about biophilia. So I'm going to speak about biophilia as it relates to my work and my personal worldview of animism. And my hope with this video is to share with you what's informing my current curiosity in order to, to stoke conversations and in order to have a little bit of a provocation because some things that I say in it really require a, a response. So like any talk, I set it up by discussing what the backdrop is. And the backdrop right now, of course, is planetary emergency. And within this planetary emergency, I've been contemplating the relationship between uh, two prominent lines of thinking. The first is that our planet's life carries within it a multiplicity of intelligences that, that we as humans are only now just coming to acknowledge. And we're seeking a kind of a harmony with this natural intelligence by elevating its alien aptitudes as separate and distinct from our own and worthy of our greater recognition and ultimately our admiration too. And this is all part of our effort to avert ecological collapse by identifying with other life and the geniuses that reside within them. And the second line of thinking, which is absolutely unavoidable these days, is about artificial intelligence. And that's that artificial intelligences are increasingly sentient and they're working mysteriously beyond our comprehension. And some people are within corporations or as open source projects accelerating AI to what many deem to be frightening new powers. While there are others, some of these who are bringing up these frightening new powers or sounding various alarms, are seeking alignment or harmony with this artificial intelligence to avoid it turning against us or to avoid it turning us against ourselves. So I want to just point out the symmetry between these two lines of thinking about the natural intelligence and the artificial intelligence. There are natural intelligences that are already here. They're waiting for us in a way to recognize them as kin. And of course, there are these artificial intelligences that we're waiting to see how intelligent they are, how conscious they are, and ultimately if they'll free or finish us. So it strikes me that we will reveal to ourselves in this generation of thought and technological development what it is to be human within the planetary emergency by how we create a harmonious coexistence with beings, whether these beings are our biological kin, those related to us on the evolutionary tree of life, or the unknown powers summoned by our computational creations. So remember that this talk was about biophilia originally. And for this talk, I'll speak to the relationship with biological kin, mostly, and my particular variety of my relationship to it, what I call animism. So let's talk about animism. Animism was perhaps anthropology's earliest concept, and it was and very much still is used to trivialize the profusion of religions and worldviews that colonialists encountered largely in the late 1800s, but like I said, up until today, any kind of worldviews and profusions of belief systems that a thinking person would encounter and want to disregard. The technical definition of animism is, for me at least, a muddled collage. It's souls in rocks, it's spirits in plants, it's places with some ineffable essence, and it's humans having a conversation with a conscious world. Now, in the currency of ideas, animism, uh, at least to serious thinkers, would be considered to be a clear indicator of a kind of a romantic, anti-technological primitivism, if you will. Imagine people going to festivals with music and fire dancing and beating drums. And I have heard these exact accusations made against me, but those who know me know that while I'm romantic, I'm certainly not an anti-technological primitivist. The other thing about animism is that it's not a philosophy that can be dispatched in a debate. It's not an idea that can be won over by some other idea. And the reason is because it's not really a philosophy. It's an embodied, it's an intuitive way of being that fosters an intimate way of relating to life as, as a whole. 
So animism for me is my orientation to the world in its aliveness. I experience the planet as alive. I am alive with it and everything is related largely because of this aliveness. So with my animism, I believe that there are lost literacies that are still encoded in the language of our limbs. And our animal instincts and porous bodies can't help but commune with any landscape, any living landscape that we're placed inside of. And we ultimately internalize the intelligences of living landscapes and life at large before our science can deem them knowable or graspable. Like panpsychism, which posits a universal element of consciousness, animism unifies mind and matter. It's a, it's a non-dualism that blurs distinctions between the organic and inorganic and the subject and object, and ultimately it blurs what is human and what is nature. So given that I am an animist and I've been speaking publicly about it to hundreds of people at a Swiss think tank, largely in suits, I was curious how others felt about animism. So as you can see here, and so curious how others felt about animism, I, I posted on LinkedIn, as you can see here, about being an animist and specifically being an animist investor and why it was essential for me to declare my animism, largely to provoke a conversation. And I invited people in this post, which is still up and has now had more than 20,000 impressions. I invited people to speak with me about their relationship to life, if they had a name for it, like animism. And I ultimately had dozens of conversations with people from industry, uh, academia, and beyond. Actually, what I did was I opened up my calendar with a Calendly link and allowed people to book conversations with me. And sure enough, my calendar booked up very quickly. It turns out people want to discuss their connections to life. And you'd ask, what's the most common thing that I heard? And the most common thing that I heard is that what motivates people in their work is their spiritual connection to life, but that they felt that they needed to kind of hide this spiritual connection to life. So this revealed to me that there is real meaning, deep meaning that's being held back for cultural reasons, which is strange because in a time where life is ever fragile, shouldn't we be welcoming the spiritual connections or really any deeper emotional connections that augment our ability to care more for life? My own spiritual connections help me to take on life's perspectives as my own effort to kind of help represent the interests of Earth's living systems. And we evolved with all of this life. And this whole perspective is what guides Ground Effect, an animist investment studio that I co-founded. And with Ground Effect, we have two central objectives and a lot more material you can find on our website, which I'll post the link to within this video. But we have these two central objectives. You know, one is to repair this false distinction between humans and nature and to reunify humans as nature. And the other is to advance an animist worldview where there's a kind of an interbeing, an interdependence between all beings. We do this work within the story of civilization evolving from controlling and triumphing over nature to collaborating with and triumphing as nature. And that's a very important distinction. Over nature to as nature, but not necessarily with nature, as nature. So let's just back up a little bit and talk about what nature is to the dominant models of the world. The current economy decides the ultimate fate of nature, managing it as instrumental and valuing it by what the market is willing to pay for its, um, its ancient legacy right now. And these are millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years of evolution condensed into the, the blink of an eye, or maybe you could say the blink of a price. And this is commodification as a kind of predatory simplification of impossibly expressive beings and their living landscapes. Historically, economic growth has mostly come with the tendency to reduce the complexity of life, deadening it by seeing it on human terms alone. And this has meant that the dominant model of wealth creation is from nature's destruction. Many have benefited from this private wealth creation, myself included, while depleting and impoverishing the commons, which is what I and others are waking up to at this moment. So how would we triumph as nature? 
Well, we'd start by redefining nature as something that we are, that we are nature, that nature is neither, it's neither out there nor it's in here, but it's strangely both in here and out there. And personally, as an aside, a project that I have that could be my lifelong project is to retire this word nature because of just how it seems to suggest a kind of a dualism between an in here and an out there. But that's for another talk. We are nature because being alive is having within us other life. And being alive is being within larger life. Here, of course, we're, we're breathing the creations of organisms humming away with their oceans, just as we're taking in our forests that envelop naked continents with their generous teeming niches. And of course, inside of us, over half of our cells, nearly 100 trillion are the microbiome, non-human microbes. But we couldn't call ourselves human without them with us symbiotically in a mutually beneficial multi-species chorus. And nearly all living beings contain the same biological clock. It's a shared genetic and molecular engine that, that gears us all and ourselves to the axis of the rotating earth, something that is common amongst all living organisms. So given that we are nature, we then redefine wealth on nature's terms. And this kind of wealth would gain value when we improve the health and generativity of the living planetary commons. This proposal to redefine wealth in nature's terms, while we are nature, it, it evokes entirely new questions about how to price nature and how to value nature. But if we are nature, then in a way, as we begin to ask these questions about pricing and valuing nature, we are having to ask very new questions about how we price and value ourselves. Now, to answer these questions, how to value and price nature, how to value and price ourselves, it requires a kind of rekindling of the sense of kinship with our living ancestry. And it starts with a, an openness to the elements of human experience that we too often neglect when we are overemphasizing rationality. And these elements include things like intuition and spirit and celebration and joy and beauty. These albeit fuzzy feelings, are indeed best steeped in the inquiry of the objectivity of our finely tuned instruments that have illuminated the earth as an interconnected unity. Notice that these fuzzy feelings connected to intuition and the objectivity of our finely tuned instruments come together in their own symbiosis. For example, satellites can perceive in invisible frequencies and they feed supercomputers that model weather patterns and predict hurricanes and whale migrations. Drones, you can't see here, buzz overhead. They sniff for, for methane leaks and they're also actively out there gathering evidence to prosecute animal poaching. And in our pockets or wherever they might lie, we have billions of devices that if used with their AI and their cameras can scan a tree for its carbon, for its age, and for its identity. And we have a whole new suite of technologies like synthetic biology. Here, the example of colossal bio bioscience is one of our investments. There are synthetic biology companies that make microbes into machinery for human nutritional needs. And, and if here, of course, you see that you have a company seeking to revive extinct megafauna to trample tundra soils. These technologies have encrusted us and they've encrusted the earth with, uh, with a sensual delicacy and an audacious sense of possibility. And they grant us a closer encounter with a, with a world of unrevealed minds. And these encounters with a world of unrevealed minds is how we begin to interface with and, and mix ourselves with the many existing and yet to be invented perspectives beyond our kind. Now, in all of this, we're sensing life's complexity. And when we do so, we're extracting data from it, and that is always fragmentary. So given this, we should be very receptive to other ways of knowing and relating that, that allow us to forge wholehearted bonds with the living systems that we are here trying to care more about. 
going back to the work of ground effects, our theory of change strives for a systemic integration of the sensual animus sensibilities with the rigors of science that allow us to embed this nature or we are nature into human decision making. So it's been a lot of pure thought to this point. I want to get to some examples that give you a tiny slice of our portfolio of activities so you can see how we operationalize an animist idea in practice. So the first of five categories that I'll be discussing today, by no means exhaustive, is biodiversity. And biodiversity is the best term that we have to measure the health and, uh, and frankly, just the vitality of all living systems. And here in this OECD report, you can read that 100% of our economy is derived from nature and that it's an estimate from the OECD that biodiversity loss, that is the damage that we cause to, to nature, is a drag on the global economy of more than $4 trillion per year. And similarly, this is from the Paulson report that has become a touchstone for the biodiversity movement that that there is a biodiversity funding gap. That's the amount of money that we need to be spending on biodiversity that we're not. And this is estimated to be $700 billion or more a year. And given this enormous sum of money, you can imagine that huge and well-organized financial forces are now rushing in to this realm of biodiversity as something that is a, a question of planetary health after carbon, trying to turn it into markets and ultimately seeking to financialize and securitize it for the purposes of profit. Now, in anticipation of this movement, and given it's happening right now, we are investing actively to help understand and translate the living systems inside of this biodiversity that we are here to serve. And much of this, this sensing and listening is called MRV. You'll hear it often in this world, and it stands for measurement, reporting, and verification. I'll focus just on the, the measurement part, although we're active in reporting and verification as well. And there are novel companies in measurement that we're interested in and involved with, and they use novel approaches like, like bioacoustics. You know, how do you listen to an ecosystem and then assess its health based upon its sonic signatures alone? And also eDNA or environmental DNA, where you can take samples from the air or from the water or swabs from really any surface and do a DNA assessment in order to achieve a better awareness of what kind of life is present and its state of health. And we're also investors in biodiversity funds like Superorganism. And through all of these, we are backing initiatives that address the drivers of extinction and that bring forth biodiversity enabling technologies and businesses, hoping to create a whole new industry of biodiversity. With biodiversity, the entrepreneurial challenge, and I say this from the perspective of both a venture capitalist and as, as somebody who's actively involved uh, in the question of entrepreneurship and biodiversity, the central challenge is to create a nature positive economy where the value of regenerating nature exceeds the value of extracting it. One very inspiring example, and it's albeit very nascent, is from our friends at EQX Biome. And they are amongst many outfits that are creating market infrastructure for nature transactions at planetary scale. And EQX Biome are currently trying to prove out this model in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, as you can read about in this story in The Guardian that there is more money to be made from the conservation and regeneration of biodiversity than there is from the drilling and extraction of oil. So watch this story very closely. Now, if successful, the model of EQX Biome would elevate and compensate people who live in geographies of heightened biodiversity to be guardians managing and monitoring nature in its intactness. And these people who live in these geographies of heightened biodiversity are very frequently indigenous people, or they are people who are having to decide on any given day, does it make more sense? And is there more money to extract nature or to keep it intact and regenerating? So as you can see, investing in biodiversity is to be in active dialogue with ultimately tricky ethical questions about how nature will be financialized when the, when the chaos of capitalism meets forest communities. A broader question that we ask with Ground Effect is how markets and nature can be compatible. And our second example here is Walden, and it offers us a lot of insight. The reason is because 
we invested in Walden as a bank, which you would think is very conventional, but this is a very different bank. It's a bank owned by their depositors and Walden loans exclusively to local businesses that strengthen their regional food system. For many people, food is their, their first and strongest connection to nature. It's an everyday encounter of the relationship between human health and environmental health. So with Walden, we're helping bring financial credit to entrepreneurs that strengthen the bonds between, between people and their food sheds. Helping expand this regional regenerative food system is for us a, pra a very practical approach to animism because it delivers health to the, to the land and it delivers health to the humans who grow this food on the land and ultimately eat with the land. The third example is science. We're talking about science focusing on mycorrhizal science. And here we see SPUN, which is the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks. This is Toby Kears, one of its really the founder and chief instigator. And SPUN is a global science initiative to map the world's fungal biodiversity. SPUN researches fungal species in soil that facilitate shared experiences between the many lives within it and their exchanges. And we back science like SPUN because it brings to light the vast intelligences. Here you can see in Lou Schwartzberg's Fantastic Fungi. It brings to light the vast intelligence on the family tree of life. And it expands for the public their curiosity in nature, growing their sense of awe and wonder, ultimately making them care more. SPUN's pioneering fungal science will also likely lead to waves of new science and entrepreneurship that we're also helping stoke. So for example, Here's something in our portfolio called Co-Renewal. It's an organization that we've invested in. They're using mushrooms to help forests in California recover from historic devastating fires and to also remove pollutants from the soil. In the fourth example, I'll talk about uh, the rights of nature, which is something that some people would say is closer to philanthropy, and I grant you that. But in the audience that I spoke to, in Zurich, I was able to ask them, hey, have you heard of the rights of nature? And well, a trickle of hands went up. I would put it at somewhere between five and seven people in a crowd of 300. So this rights of nature evidently is not particularly prominent or popular, but it is a growing movement. And it's a growing movement because it is suggesting that nature can gain legal standing so that it can defend itself against exploitation. And this here river, is the Cowichan River, a picture taken by David Stanley. And this is a river that we are actively supporting to have its own rights. And we believe that nature could have its own rights from rivers that litigate against those that pollute them to animals that can assert their personhood. We envision humans better representing nature, what is called more than human representation. And we also envision nature eventually representing itself, gaining agency in the human world being rewarded for its value and standing alongside humans in a true democracy of beings. And finally, our growing emphasis is to help shift inner consciousness towards the animist worldview. The first example is called Life Worlds, available at lifeworld.earth, and it's a podcast and a, a larger project of spiritual ecology from Alexa, my co-founder in Ground Effect. And her project Life Worlds is about seeing and feeling the world of other forms of life and to know what it's like to have experiences not our own because ultimately it enlarges the moral circle and grows the ways that we all care. We are looking to back initiatives with the ethos of Life Worlds that stimulate and inspire a spiritual aesthetic and an um, intellectual connection to the plurality of life. Meanwhile, our larger abiding mission is to sensitize humans and human systems to life's constant contact, whether through its worldviews or emerging technologies. Which brings us to the beginning of my talk. Now, do you remember this symmetry between natural intelligence and artificial intelligence? Well, the symmetry I pointed out between deciphering the sentience or the consciousness in natural and in artificial intelligence. Our search for sentience is evidence for me of us waking up to an entangled world of startling agency at the edges of contemporary rationality. To really listen to this world is to learn hybrid ways of knowing that blend human, more than human, and machine intelligence. And 
for me at least, it's through these ways of knowing. It's only through these blended ways of knowing and being that we'll be able to design more careful interventions in the governance of a planet that we know and more importantly, that we feel as more and more alive. So thank you very much. <laughs>